Good morning, my name is David Carlack and I'm the director of a short film titled Rise and, uh, and with me is Scott Mesker, the visual effects supervisor. Uh, Rise is a film uh, about robots in the future and, um, and so what we're going to be doing today is sharing with you or demoing uh, the visual effects pipeline that Scott has built uh, to bring these characters to life in addition to a uh, pipeline that he created to create digital sets that we can revisit uh, in post you know, after we've shot the film. Uh, in order to get pickup shots and uh, and reshoots, as well as completely CG photorealistic, um, you know, shots that um, that rival anything that you could get on film uh, on the day. And uh, and so starting with Basil, our lead character, uh, is uh, designed by Greg Broadmoor over at Weta. And uh, and so with Scott, you know, we've we've been, you know, auditioning different ways to bring this character to life. And uh, and Scott's going to get into that uh, right now. And uh, Scott, take it away. So this uh, right now is going to be our uh, first area I'm going to cover. So what you're seeing is a screen grab inside of Moto with uh, Adam Lewis driving. And uh, you know, if you're not familiar with Adam Lewis's work, you can go to AdamVFX.com. And so what Adam is doing is he's taking a scan that we have from Hydraulics. And so Hydraulics is really nice enough to actually uh, give us a scan of Anton. And so what Adam's doing is he's going to go and take an existing topology um, bring it into Moto, and he's then going to take the scan data and he's going to basically match up and try to get all the vertices to conform to the scan data using the existing topology. So what's really, really important is that he starts with just half the face um, and starting off uh, symmetrically. And uh, then he'll take that half, half side of the face and actually bring it into Topo Gun. And what you know, Topo Gun works as is it it relaxes the vertices against the scan data and kind of works like a magnet would um, with a, another surface. And it's a little bit of a back and forth um, method to, to go between Topo Gun and Moto to make sure that you can conform the geometry as, as close as possible to the original scan before you actually bring that in. And so what Adam's doing now is he's um, you know, stitching and mirroring the other face um, to get it a, a little bit more um, asymmetrical and um, he'll bring it right back into uh, to Moto to kind of uh, smooth out those vertices, get them a lot closer and then go back and forth uh, from top of gun to repeat that process a few times until we get uh, a, a close, close looking face. So because Anton is going to be uh, CG everywhere else, so his whole robot body will be CG, what we do is we, we actually film the uh, plate photography of him acting in the scene file and then we'll track and roto his face and then uh, integrate that into uh, the actual CG robot uh, together. So what you're seeing here is um, uh, a finished torso model uh, by um, Broadmoor and also uh, Mike Hill was doing some 3D concept to this character to really add a lot of the uh, intricate 3D details around the, the chest and head area. So it's really, really exciting. Wesley Griffith uh, also did the uh, resurfacing and extra modeling of the hard surface work. So, you know, there's a lot of artistry involved in getting this uh, asset complete. Um, so you can see we're in Moto right now with about 38 uh, million polygons uh, subdivided. And uh, I'm just kind of going over some of the, uh, the, the, the intricate details of this model. And, you know, it, it's a very large asset. I've done a lot of robot assets. and. I think this is really the largest one. And so uh, the next thing I have to do is basically texture all this stuff in Mari and then set up the V-Ray renders. And so what you're seeing now is a really primitive, this is like a, uh, a quick little color test. There's no textures on the robot. Um, it's a temp uh, texture for the face, but you can see we're trying to come up with a way to blend the uh, photography with the actual uh, robot aspects and create uh, the refracting layers uh, beneath the skin. Uh, you know, to kind of marry everything together. So it's still work in progress, but we're definitely uh, going to be getting somewhere pretty soon. Uh, all right, going to the environment. So uh, creating these environment, the CG environments, it's a process of uh, capturing spherical photography with non-spherical photography. So what I did is I went around shooting with a 24 mil 1.4 uh, Nikkor lens, and then I also used a 10.5 Nikkor uh, DX lens that was uh, shaved by a gentleman in Germany named Tobias Vollmer at uh, 
pano3d.de. So he was very, very helpful in actually getting that lens perfectly uh, adjusted to, to shoot the photography. And so it's really important to go through um, grabbing as much detail as you can with the 24 mil. But what actually happens is you don't grab everything. There's no way to grab everything with your light changing with a non-spherical lens. So that's when you have to put on the uh, the 10.5 and actually shoot all the photography with the spherical HDR because you'll grab everything um, all around you at 11K, which is a lot of resolution to use later on for painting. Uh, the other important thing is to actually shoot a Macbeth chart in the, uh, the same spot for both lenses um, so you can calibrate the, uh, the actual color going from one image to another image. So you can see here in this video that we do have a lot of range of the light collected. Now, the next part is the scanning of the set. So we once, once again used a Faro 3D scanner. Uh, Faro was great to help us out and just uh, help us capture this environment uh, for our purposes. And there's, you know, a large, large area. Um, we originally were only going to use the scan data for two CG shots, but uh, we scanned a little bit extra. And you can see that by this window, we have a, um, a little bit of uh, a geometry that actually captured outside of the building uh, for creating the, uh, the buildings outside. Um, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of detail involved with these scans. And it, using GeoMagic, it's a really quick way to actually take the scan data. And what I'll do is I'll chop it up in sections. So we, we have about maybe 10 to 12 areas of the scan that are going to be meshed into uh, really high um, polygons. So you can see here we have about 50 million polygons uh, running on a, a K5000 inside and um, if you wanted to uh, you know using the K6000 I could get about hundred million polygons inside viewport 2.0 which is really a lot of data and what's important is to resurface all this raw scan data and then line up photography to it so what I'll then do is take the 24 uh, millimeter photography I'll tone map it so I can you know go through and we'll kind of use this to uh, line up the cameras and then um, it will also assist in the paintwork from, for projecting from the camera, but also for the extra modeling help. Sometimes the scanner won't pick up everything because there's so many occluding objects, so you can then line up the undistorted photography uh, to the scan data inside of Maya to very, very quickly um, get some more accurate results uh, in terms of missing information. So this is probably the longest process. Doing all the camera lineups is very, very long. So what you really want to do is make sure that uh, you, you save some time to get those cameras lined up with the accurate scan data. So going back into Moto, what we're going to do is we're actually going to do some resurfacing using the topology pen. And the uh, topology pen is very quick because I can grab edges, move the edges around, I can take the, uh, the actual vertices uh, without switching a tool and adjust that all in one. So it's very, very fast when it comes to actually uh, resurfacing all the scan data to a very clean quad mesh. So, you know, remodeling everything in quads is, is very, very important. So next what we'll do is we'll, we'll take it back into my, double check the accuracy of the retopology against the original scan data, make any uh, final adjustments. And uh, this environment was definitely um, uh, not just done by myself. I had uh, Carlos uh, Foyo to uh, help out and also Halon uh, provided some, some really great help in terms of getting all the uh, um, resurface geometry done. And, um, so you can see here in our video, what we have is we have the outside of the environment that's been modeled. And because the scanner didn't pick up everything, I still had a small little chunk of scan data that I was able to line up the camera to. And once you have a, a, a correct camera placed in 3D space against the scan data, I can then model from just the photography and the lined up camera. Now, going into Moto, I found this, uh, this amazing guy, um, Seneca. He's this Moto Pro, and he has a a page called indigosm.com and I believe he works at ID or it's our id software and there's this amazing tool called lazy select and what his lazy select script does is it will select all similar faces in a scene file and allow you to very very quickly um, start the UV process so this whole environment uh, that we're actually using was done in about uh, Gosh, I'm trying to think. It was probably done in like one sitting, like one 17, 16 hour sitting of doing all the actual UVs. And um, I'm never really big into UVs, but uh, actually doing UVs in Moto is a lot of fun. 
Um, it's very, very quick and very intuitive to actually use Moto for the UVing, for the resurfacing. It's a fantastic tool. And you know, I'm not just saying that because I love the foundry. I'm, I really do mean it. I would not use something if it was not the best um, tool for the job. And uh, in terms of the UVing and model work, you know, Moto is phenomenal for that. Now, one of the um, as you can see here in this clip, what we do is we have multiple sections that are actually set up. We have a, you know, a high resolution area, which is all 8K tiles. And then outside the 8K tile area, we're going to have about 4K tiles. And then beyond the 4K, which is like the far wall, we're just using 2K because we're never planning on going you know, to the far edges of the uh, environment. Um, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of texture going on in the scene file. But um, you know, uh, we'll try it out and see what happens in the renders. Now, the last thing I want to go over is a small little thing, but you can see here in the corner, what we have is we have uh, statistics. And what the s statistics actually do inside of Moto is they show how many triangles you have, how many uh, four-sided polygons, and then five and greater. And Because really what you want is you want to have all quads. And instantly, just by looking at this, I can actually s show and see how many triangles are mixed in with my nice clean quads. And you know, there's nothing worse than starting to paint and you run into all these issues with the topology of all the uh, polygons not being uh, you know, quads or all you have these hidden end gons somewhere. So just being able to look very, very quickly, um, select and see all the bad geometry you're seeing is an important thing to um, be aware of and know. So I uh, definitely give props to Moto for making um, some very, very nice tools. All right, so now we're gonna go and do a live demo inside of Mari using the uh, K6000 graphics card uh, by NVIDIA that just came out. And so here we have the uh, Rise environment and looking at the uh, resolution for the UVs, we have uh, 8K for all the close-up detail. For the uh, medium res detail, we're using about 4K tiles. And for everything outside, which is gonna be the low res, I'm showing about 2K. Uh, for those tiles. So it's kind of set up and split for GPU so we can you know, load everything onto a, a, the card. And, and currently for this project, we're using a K6000. So the K6000 has about 12 gigabytes of RAM. And what's really important about that is that I can use the highest resolution of um, the paint buffer, all the, the, the actual textures that we're baking onto this, and then what we're previewing as well, our texture bias inside of Mari is set for about 16K. So with a 16K texture, I can keep and paint all these environments without having low resolution textures load in um, to fit uh, all the images on RAM. So you're able to paint these massive environments in a short amount of time. So what I'm gonna do is go to one of the camera lineups and you can see right here we have frames uh, one to 94, all the different lined up positions uh, from the scan data that we did. So if we go, for instance, I'm gonna turn off all the objects other than our medium quality and uh, we'll just turn everything else off here. And uh, I'm gonna grab a single frame that was taken with the Nikon D800. Um, and we're gonna go and grab frame number 20. So you can see we have all of our undistorted, uh, neutralized images in full EXR. So we'll grab uh, frame 20. All right, fantastic. And Kind of zooming out, you can see the film gate of the camera along with the uh, 8K paintable resolution. And I'm just going to line up the edges to, uh, to fit this uh, camera projector. And I can go around and you know, really quickly kind of adjust the exposure just to visually see where I'm being painting, painting all the dark areas. And uh, we'll just kind of like scribble on the screen where we want this current projection to uh, paint through onto the geometry. So it's, uh, it's really good to use the uh, non-spherical photography just to get the real close-up um, extra sharp detail that you won't be able to capture from a uh, 11K spherical HDR. Uh, using both of these images is very beneficial uh, for all the uh, uh, photo reprojection techniques for the environment. So if I turn off our wireframe display you can see the uh, areas that we're actually painting on the screen and uh, what I'm going to then do is just uh, kind of bake and commit this to the disk. So we're using a Fusion I.O. card for all the cache data. Fusion I.O. is very, 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 very fast at handling a lot of this baking data along with the 
uh, 12, like the 8K buffer. If we take a look at all the uh, settings for preferences for GPU, I mean, we're almost maxed out. We have uh, you know, 8K for this, 16K for that. So um, it, was, uh, it was really, really exciting to be able to take this K6000, try it out, build this environment. Uh, Carl Rand from the Foundry um, spent uh, a little, some, some time working with us with NVIDIA to, to really maximize the potential of this card uh, with Mari. And it's pretty, uh, pretty exciting to actually see the results when everything is said and done. Um, so uh, just kind of looking through the environment, you can see we have uh, areas that are, have been occluded from the projection. And so the next thing I want to do is I want to start loading up a, a spherical projection. And what makes this technique um, a lot easier in Mari 2.0 is the whole layer system. So I can actually load up multiple spherical HDRs, 11Ks. I'm not restricted to one or two. I can load up uh, you know, eight or nine of these at once. And these are multiple 11K images being handled on the GPU um, in real time. So I can interactively uh, move them around. So if we go over to our layer system here, you can see I already have some pre-lined up uh, spherical HDRs. Um, I also have a some geometry in the scene file that kind of shows me where these um, projections lie. So these were basically exported after I lined them up. And uh, if we want, for instance, uh, position number two, which covers this area of the, uh, um, the scene, I can just turn off our uh, helper. And then we're going to go up and find uh, position number two. I'm going to paste it over the layer of the, uh, the current baked camera geometry. I'm going to remove the current mask that we have existing prior. And uh, let's load up the 11K file. So let's go to position two under here, 10.5. And here's our map. So we're going to load this up. All right, great. So the 11K file is loaded. We're going to turn this on. And uh, you can see there's a lot of resolution here in this one image. You can also see where you kind of lose quality um, in the, the good and bad parts of the map. And so the fun thing about this is Setting up multiple spherical HDRs is very, very easy. I can also go in here. Um, I can you know, hold down control, middle mouse roll, and we can move the uh, offset of this in 3D space um, you know, to do all the lineups very, very quickly. Uh, we can also go to the rotation. I can middle mouse drag, and you know, we can slowly, um, finally, kind of precisely place the rotation of the environment as well. And uh, when we want to paint a layer and say, hey, I want to basically paint, um, keep you know some areas of the map that are from the camera projection or either from the spherical HDR. What I want to do is I want to right click on the layer mask and we're going to add this layer mask, choose hide all. And when we choose the hide all for the layer mask, what this is going to do is this is going to allow us to then go in and paint the areas where we want the spherical HDR. So you can see here, I can just go in here, keep all the good areas with the spherical HDR, and then choose or decide where I want the uh, camera projections to lie. And once I'm happy with this painted area of the spherical HDR, I can then copy that. Now, if there are other parts that don't seem to really line up as well for the spherical HDR, what I can do is I can take the position two, which is um, already using a loaded HDR, and uh, copy and paste that map. Uh, when you copy and paste multiple HDRs that are the same, it's not going to use a, a full one gigabyte of uh, texture memory. It's going to probably use about four to three hundred megabytes. So you can really uh, reuse the same HDRs without you know, setting your overhead of your graphics GPU, uh, which is great. And then what I'll do is I'll basically remove the, uh, remove the mask for this and I can you know, reposition the uh, offset of this environment uh, like so. And uh, right click again and we'll go layer mask, add mask, hide all. And I'm just going to kind of uh, start painting a new layer of that same HDR uh, kind of like on top of the pre-existing one. And if, you know, if I want to pull something away, I press X, uh, we swap the uh, matte color, and then I can you know, finally adjust the, the actual blend of the spherical HDR. And once again, all these spherical HDRs are still live, so I can go back and readjust them without actually um, you know, having to uh, unbake them. So if we want to paint on them, I can just right click on that layer. We can choose uh, convert to paintable and there we have it. So what I'm going to do is now load up the uh, finished piece and we'll close this scene file and load up the other one. So we're just going to 
save that. All right, so um, going through this, you can see all the different uh, camera positions that we have recorded. I'm gonna also go to a FBX. It's like, kind of like a fly through of the scene file. So you can see we're gonna have all the stuff being loaded up and um, it, you know, it holds up really well um, under a 4K television as well. We could you know, definitely paint a lot more detail depending on where the UVs are laid out. So this is kind of the high quality area of the map. You know, we have the full range of the HDR. Um, I mean, there's tremendous range painted. You can use all this for your uh, reflections of your, your CG rendered assets, um, recreating uh, the photography of the plate, which we're trying to do with Rise, instead of doing all these pickup shots. And there's also really a great, um, deal of uh, uncharted territories when it comes to even creating virtual environments with uh, Unity um, for the Oculus Rift, which I really think, um, if you're familiar with that device and maybe you're making content for it, this would be a, a really good, might be a fantastic tool to actually get the, you know, some of those, um, you know, really quick photorealistic results um, for a, uh, a really neat new exciting medium. And uh, right now what we're seeing is this is a preview um, just a quick test render, it's not 100%, but uh, I think it definitely shows what you can actually do with uh, Mari and the, uh, the K6000. So this whole environment um, has full HDR capabilities. We're rendering inside of V-Ray 3.0. Um, we're using a physical camera, so they're very, very quick renders. There's no post other than a, a custom LUT that we did, but um, you know all the exposure, the depth of field, um, everything you see with the motion blur, it's all a V-Ray physical camera. So, you know, what I do like about using V-Ray's physical camera is that it works like a real camera. Um, I think there's maybe one other render that has a nice camera that's Maxwell, uh, where I can type in an f-stop, but everyone else fails the test in terms of, you know, creating a way to replicate the camera that is based on real-world um, uh, physics and techniques. So, you know, if you're a photographer coming in, um, to do this sort of work, V-Ray is definitely uh, amazing for that. Um, but you know, these renders take about 20 seconds and the light effects, you see all the glow. Um, diffusion is actually being calculated in V-Ray at render as well. Uh, so um, we're pretty excited about this. And uh, David, do you wanna uh, talk about this? Let me, uh... And uh, so yeah, I mean, what's really exciting about capturing a set like this is that uh, it gives a director options. Um, you know, by having uh, a fully detailed digital set with a dynamic range uh, of all the photography in addition to the 3D data captured by the LiDAR scan, you're essentially able to revisit a set. Um, I mean, you could even go as far as uh, using a light stage to, to shoot foreground actors, foreground elements uh, that, that need to be live action, and then having those, um, you know, be integrated with this uh, CG environment. And uh, you know, all you really need to do is just you know, give uh, you know, your visual effects supervisor about 30 minutes and, uh, and a, an entire set can be surveyed uh, you know, through LiDAR and HDR photography. And so you know, we're very excited to share this technique with you. Um, you know, without the support of NVIDIA and, uh, and the Foundry, this really wouldn't be possible. And so uh, you know, thank you to them. And uh, yeah, have a wonderful time here at SIGGRAPH. Thank you.